Hello again, welcome back. I'm Matthew Wood and you're listening to Journeys to the Ice, the podcast of the Antarctic Research Centre. In episode 3, we were introduced to the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program research vessel, the Joides Resolution. Following the GNS Science Children's Program in early January, the Resolution headed south to drill and retrieve cores from beneath the seafloor off the coast of Wilkes Land in Antarctica. The aim? To better understand the Antarctic environment during past warm extremes. Joining the international science team was Rob Mackay of the Antarctic Research Centre. For over two months, Rob lived and worked on board the Resolution, gaining a novel marine vantage point from which to observe both the Antarctica of today and, through the collection of long sedimentary histories, the Antarctica of the distant past. So Rob, you've recently returned to New Zealand after your latest journey to the ice. You've been to the Antarctic several times before, but this was your first trip south by boat, is that right? That's correct. Obviously when you travel south by plane, you go from you know the midsummer Christchurch heat and then Eight hours later, you're stepping out onto the sea ice runway at McMurdo Sound, completely dressed up in your extreme cold weather gear. It must have been quite a change making that trip by sea and experiencing the transition to Antarctic conditions much more gradually. Yeah, it was was very different, particularly leaving from my home port. So I woke up in the morning, went down to the boat, got on the boat, and then I was sailing to Antarctica. It was quite a surreal experience, sort of leaving out through the Wellington Heads, you know, in t-shirts and shorts, and then... Yeah, as you say, gradually as you go through the south, the seas get rougher and everything starts getting colder and the decks get slipperier and you really get that sense that you're going on a journey or an adventure, whereas you don't quite get that on a plane. You sort of get the shock as the doors open up and the, the wall of cold hits you. I imagine if you'd left a couple of weeks ago, perhaps that climatic transition wouldn't have been as noticeable. Uh, any listeners from Wellington will remember on the 12th of March, we had this freak southerly blast come through and... I think temperatures dropped by about 11 degrees in half an hour or something like that. I had a flashback during that storm and that I was at a wedding and we had to put a tent up, marquee for the wedding and we'd just finished it and the, the, the tent blew away in the oh. storm so we had all of us sort of putting rocks around the awning and yeah, it reminded <laughs> me of my days in Antarctica. Oh, I can imagine. And you know, this is supposed to be the tail end of summer. I really hate to think what the winter has in store for us. So your study area was off the coast of Wilkes Land. Now, sea ice is a fairly common feature of the seascapes surrounding Antarctica, even in the summertime. But the Joides Resolution isn't actually a heavy-duty icebreaker ship, is it? No, it is ice-strengthened, so it can go through about a metre of ice. But yeah, the regulations sort of don't allow it to get into heavy ice. Did the presence of sea ice create any difficulties in accessing any of the planned drill sites? Yeah, it certainly did. They were very nervous about getting stuck in sea ice there, as you always would be. The main concern was multi-year ice. There was a big tongue of it coming across one of the drill sites that we were trying to get to, so that stopped us from getting to one of the drill sites. But the biggest concern was icebergs, so that's parts of the grounded ice sheet that have carved into the sea and are much bigger, and no boat, not even an icebreaker, can handle those. We had two drill sites that we started drilling, and then we had to pull out because an iceberg came over the drill site. So we had done two days of drilling and then had to move. And in that case, we had this quite unique system that we drop basically a funnel down the pipe, and then we pull the pipe out, The funnel goes into the seafloor and then we move the drill ship with the the pipe hanging and then once the icebergs pass we go back in and we re-enter the hole. It sounds very simple on paper but when you see it happening it's a very difficult technological feat because you've got literally four kilometres of pipe hanging below a ship. It's like a string of spaghetti. I mean it sounds something like trying to thread a needle blindfolded from you know 10 metres away. It's definitely along those lines. Yeah that's really impressive. Now, I heard that the ship was completely refit a few years back, basically from the ground up, or from the ocean up, I guess, in this case. A lot of the systems and equipment were replaced and updated. How did the science facilities compare to others that you'd worked in in the past, like those at McMurdo Station or on other drilling vessels? Well, this is my first time on a drilling ship. We spent three months in McMurdo Station where they have a very good science lab. A lot more space there. When we did the sedimentary descriptions, we could sort of close the doors and just have our own time to describe the cores. Whereas here, it's a lot more cramped because the space is at a premium. But it was a world-class lab. I mean, we got a lot of data straight off the boat so we can start working immediately on the data that was collected. I remember in the third episode of this podcast, Richard Levy of GNS Science was saying that 
The labs on board the ship have all the fancy equipment that you'd find in the earth science departments of you know, major universities. Certainly in New Zealand, anyway. Definitely. I mean, we came off the boat with an age model based on you know the paleomagnetic reversals that were observed in the core, and that's you know we only have one of those labs in New Zealand. Yeah, we got it on board. We have the data immediately, and we know what age the sediments are, and that's a big help when you want to interpret them. One of the major goals of the science team that you were part of on this expedition was to collect geological histories that documented past warm extremes, including the so-called super hot house conditions that existed before the Antarctic ice sheets began to form around 35 million years ago. Now, the Geordie's Resolution website summed up the super hot house world by saying, think crocodiles and palm trees at the poles. Is that fairly representative of what the climate was like at that time? It's a fairly good representation. The crocodile and palm trees mostly come from evidence from the North Pole during that same time. We haven't yet recovered those sediments from Antarctica, so this was the first opportunity to do that. We're pretty confident that we have got those intervals where we can get a glimpse into the greenhouse or the hothouse in Antarctica. There's still a lot of work to actually decide how warm it was and what creatures were living in Antarctica at that time, but that would take several years of lab work to work those sort of questions out. Just to put it in context, what sort of atmospheric CO2 concentrations are we talking about in the super hothouse world compared to the present day? Well, today it's approximately 390 and, and rising up to you know 400 parts per million of CO2. Back in the 34 million to 50 million year time frame, you're probably looking at between 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million. So it's quite a significant environment, but there's potential that we will go into that if we keep on the business as usual with CO2 emissions. So that's why it's sort of one of these fundamental questions we have to answer is what was happening to the poles when we did have these six streams of CO2 that are not unrealistic if we keep along our current path. It's possible that some people are hearing this and thinking, well, the projected levels of atmospheric CO2 are within the natural range observed in the geologic record, so perhaps humans aren't actually responsible for the current warming trend, and even if we are, there's clearly nothing to worry about. But of course, 35 million years is a very long time, and when we focus on the glacial-interglacial cycles of the last million years or so, we can see that even the current concentrations are well above the natural variability at this time scale. And even that short-term variability in ice cores is still on a much broader time scale than what we're seeing today. I mean, exactly. the rate of CO2 that has been put in in the last 200 years is beyond anything we've seen in the geological past. So although we can use these past analogues, we are sort of going into unknown territory in terms of the rate of change that we might be inducing. So how many cores did you end up collecting? We drilled in total seven holes, and a couple of them are unsuccessful. You have issues when you drill in certain environments where you can't see what the seafloor is. You don't know what tool to use. So some tools are more successful at, say, drilling a loose gravel as opposed to a, a hard cemented sandstone or something like that. So the first hole we tried drilling, it was unsuccessful because we kept trying to hit the seafloor with the piston core and it kept rejecting it because we were hitting gravel, which is the hardest thing in, in the world to drill. So in that case, we had to move to the next site and we ended up getting a hole that was a thousand metres deep with good recovery. So we got a very successful drill core at that site. And then the other five sites, we sort of moved on to the continental shelf, which is the area closer to the continent. So when you get closer to the continent, you have this issue of sea ice and icebergs. So we were constantly moving back and forward relating to where sea ice was and where icebergs were. So we tried drilling three holes on the continental shelf. We got one very successful hole, which recorded the last 10,000 years. That was triple cord. And we got approximately 200 metres of sediment out of those, which will hopefully provide an ice core type record from sedimentary environment, which provides some insight into what sea ice was doing in the past and what phytoplankton were doing, how productive were phytoplankton in the past. That was a very successful hole. And then we got a couple of other holes in the continental shelf, which were shorter, but provide evidence when the ice sheet was coming back and forward across the actual drill site. So this is a measure of direct ice sheet volume. And then when you moved into deeper water, you actually start seeing what was the implications in the ocean of this ice sheet moving back and forward. So in the deeper water, we drilled another site, which was 600 metres deep, triple cord in places. So we get this overlap where we have missing core from some holes, we can see it in another hole, and we can sort of combine the records. So although we drilled seven sites, we probably drilled a total of 13 holes. That's interesting that you collected a sediment core that covered the last 10,000 years, because... In Antarctica, at least, it's a time span that's usually investigated by other means, like ice cores from coastal glaciers, for example. You mentioned that the sedimentary record allows you to gain insight into 
sea ice conditions and primary productivity in the surface ocean. How do you go about using the remains of marine plant life, such as diatoms, in environmental reconstructions in a record like this? You can use the sort of standard diatom techniques where you put some of the sediment on a microscope, you look at it, and you can see what species of diatoms are there. That's the same as looking on land and seeing what trees live in what environment. So if you go up the top of a mountain, you're going to see tussock. If you go down in a temperate rainforest, you're going to see ferns, you're going to see podocarps, those sort of things. If you go down to the beach, you're going to see beach shrubs. So you can do the same thing with diatoms. You can see diatoms that live in sea ice. You can see diatoms that live in open water. You can see diatoms that live with a freshwater cap, so you can see glacier melt coming out. So there's all those sort of ecological constraints you can see just from the species of diatoms that are present in the core. But on top of that, you also get other types of fossils. And by other types of fossils, unless you mean shells or anything like that, there are shells in there, so we can use those to date them, but you can also see the molecular remains of organisms. So you can use what are known as biomarkers, remains of marine plants, marine algae. So rather than seeing a shell, you can actually see the chemical remains of that species being there. And that again also gives you insight into how productive is this water over time and how does that relate to sea ice and also sea temperatures. I read that the 10,000 year record was of such high resolution that you could actually see annual layering of up to three centimetres of sediment. What's the geologic setting that has allowed the accumulation of such a detailed sedimentary record? The geological setting is what's known as pollinia. So the reason we could get a boat in there for two months of the year was that you get what are known as catabatic winds. So this is cold air draining off the eastern Antarctic ice sheet. So cold air sinks. So you're talking about an ice sheet that's almost four kilometres high in places and then you get in this density flow from four kilometres down to sea level. It creates very strong winds, strong cold winds. And that pushes all the sea ice out to sea. So you get this open water and winds also put a lot of dust onto the water column. So you get this feeding of iron that helps fertilise the plankton. So you get a very productive zone occurring at this site. There's also some focusing of the sediment into deeper parts of the continental shelf, so some of the sediment does get focused, but you can definitely see that these are annual layers. You can see mats of diatoms that have pretty much just died after the spring bloom, so you can definitely tell it's a primary signal. It's not all reworked sediment. So was the drill site within a specific small fault-bounded basin or anything like that, or was it more representative of a larger area of the continental shelf? I mean, it's a reasonably large basin. It's not widespread. We did have to find the exact site, and that's done through many years of site surveys. So there is some area where the sediment does all get focused, but it seems to be getting focused on a seasonal basis rather than reworked over hundreds of years. So it's, it's quite a unique environment, particularly with that thickness. There are a lot of these sites around the Antarctic region, particularly in the Ross Sea, where you get 40, 50 metres of these sediments. But yeah, this is unique in that it's the only one which is 200 metres thick. The drilling program was running 24 hours a day, so I'm assuming you were doing long 12-hour shifts. Were you constantly enthused about what you were doing, or did you find that after a while it did become mentally or physically tiring? Because you were out there for, what was it, two months? It was there for nine weeks. Nine weeks. How were you at the end of that? You must have been looking forward to the comforts of home. I was certainly very tired and looking forward to a weekend because it is seven days a week. And it gets more intense as you go along because you have to keep writing reports. Before you get off the boat, you have to have the initial science report finished. So obviously everything sort of all comes at once. So it's all or nothing. You do get days off. You know, the days when the icebergs wouldn't let us drill. We had no drill core on the table. You did have time off and you could just go sit on the deck or go watch a movie, go to the gym, those sort of things. But yeah, you never get an escape from science. You know, it's always been talked about when you're in the galley eating, which is good. It's very exciting and you know, makes for a successful cruise in terms of the science outputs. But yeah, I've been valuing my weekends since I've got back, definitely. In those times when you were able to take a rest and enjoy the view, was there anything in particular that you saw from the deck of the ship that you think will stay with you for a long time? Certainly seeing a pod of 20 whales swim past the boat on a perfectly still day was a pretty amazing sight with penguins coming past and icebergs. I mean... It doesn't really get better than that. But I guess the most exciting thing was sitting through a grade 11 storm in the Southern Ocean. It was certainly one of the most exciting things I've ever been in. Just glad I don't get seasick. We got some spectacular sunsets, sunrises. I was quite lucky in that I worked the night shift, so I got to see both of them. And every morning we'd actually go outside and have a quick look at the sunrise. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's quite stunning seeing the sun come up over the East Antarctic ice sheet. It creates this sort of orangey red burning sky. It's spectacular. Well, thanks for sharing with us your experiences from what sounds like an amazing trip. Welcome back into the country and all the best for writing up what I'm sure will be some interesting science. Cheers. For more journeys to the ice, 
visit cyblogs.co.nz forward slash journeys to the ice. <laughs>